Can we have the choir come up, please? Everyone help us sing. of your word, but we love you, Lord, and we thank you for all you do. We just pray you'd uh, be, watch over our service tonight and it be uh, done in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. But we love you, we thank you, it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray, and amen. Amen. You may be seated. 157. 157. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Be the name. 
Well, you can be seated tonight. We want to welcome you back to Tri-State Baptist Temple. We've had uh, just a great day today already in the Lord's house. I appreciated the preaching this morning uh, so much, and we've had already a good time today singing these songs that uh, lift up the Lord, and we're just excited tonight again to hear uh, more good preaching. But we want to make a few announcements again, remind you about a few things. Don't forget, on Wednesday it is New Year's Day, but we will have our service here at 7 o'clock. There will not be patch program, there will not be youth group, uh, but we'll have everybody meeting in here together uh, on Wednesday, so we hope you'll be praying about that service and be here. Maybe you'll have uh, family or friends uh, with you, and you might want to invite them to come as well, and so uh, uh, don't forget about that service. Also, continue to pray for our Kings Court basketball program. Uh, registration is still open, by the way. If you know uh, some children who want to participate and haven't yet signed up, they can still do that at any time. And uh, uh, we have registration brochures available. If you need some more, you can see me or, or uh, Drew, and we'll get you the information you need. But we're going to start practicing this coming Saturday. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So be praying about the opportunities we'll have to minister to the children as well as their families that will be here uh, through practices and then through the games. Of course, we always have a devotion at practice and uh, during the games each uh, Saturday. So we look forward to being able to uh, just present God's word uh, during those times. So be praying about that. If you missed our, our meeting earlier and wanted to sign up, we still have the sign-up sheet over here. You can sign up as well to help us. And uh, uh, there's plenty of things to do. Uh, on Saturdays at King's Court, and so anything you, if you'd like to help us, we'll have, uh, certainly have a job that you can help us with uh, at King's Court, so that don't forget about those things, and uh, just uh, look in your bulletin, there might be a few other things uh, uh, to notice as well, but we're just excited about what God's doing, we've had a great year, and we're looking forward now to what God's going to do in the coming year, and uh, just continue to work in our church, uh, but at this time, we'll ask our men to come, we'll take up our Ties offering and faith promise this evening. Amen. Well, let's pray together tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come to this house to worship and to come up to the together corporately. We ask for only for the opportunity you've given us to give back to you with more glory. We ask that you just take the offering and take it this evening, multiply it, bless it for one of the years for that you see fit. say good evening tonight as well and welcome to our Sunday evening uh, service. We had a good day today and it's good to see you and uh, tonight we're going to receive our change offering. Uh, we're in our last service in the year of 2013. We are in church together again. It'll be a new year and then we'll be counting down the months to church camp and warm weather and all those kind of things and so we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, we're working, planking plans, planning now for our camp, and we hope you'll be making time in your schedule for that as well. Uh, we're going to receive our change offering. We just put that aside and let the Lord bless it and multiply it and use it for our summer camp, and He always meets those needs. But we need any of our students here that are in elementary school. I need you to come up and help me. So Elijah, yeah, come on. Yes, come on up here. You guys come right over here. Doug's going to give you a special offering taker-upping cup. And uh, just stay right there with that. And we're going to pray. 
And uh, when we pray, we're going to ask everybody that has an offering just to raise their hand, hold it up. Uh, whoever has their hand raised, just go by them and they give you money. It's a great thing. I wish we could do that every day, everywhere we are, but it doesn't work out that way. Uh, but just bring it back up. Doug will help you get it put in that bank for us, and that will be a blessing. But we want to pray together and just thank the Lord for the offering and how faithful He is to provide for His work. So let's pray. Father, we are thankful people as we meet again tonight. Thank you, Father, for... Uh, the day you've given us and for the opportunity we have to come out and worship you. Thank you for the songs that uh, our choir helped us to sing tonight. And Lord, we just ask God you bless the offering. Uh, I'm praying now for camp this summer. God, provide laborers. Uh, Lord, lay it upon hearts of moms and dads and families to go and be a part of our camp, uh, to spend that week and be enriched in their own life and to give back to the lives of others. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you'll bless and give us a good group of campers and that, Lord, we'll see souls saved and yes. lifelong decisions made for Christ. Uh, we ask you to bless this offering. And, uh, Lord, we pray for each one of these young people here tonight. Uh, Lord, if there's one of these young people that haven't trusted you as their Savior, we pray they'll see their need to do that. And, uh, Lord, just accept you, receive you, and, Lord, live for you and serve you. So we'll thank you for it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have some offering, just hold your hand up, and uh, they're going to come by and pick that up. <clears throat> Thank you, boys and girls. Appreciate your help. Good job. And uh, we'll have something special for you at camp just because you helped. We'll give you a bed to sleep in. <laughs> and that'll, that'll be good. But uh, we are thankful, and it's good to be here tonight. Had a good day today, and uh, looking forward to tonight. I, I, I'm thankful for uh, the Lord blessing our church. We don't have a huge number of people in attendance in our church, but uh, when you look at how many uh, folks we have in our church, God's called them to preach the gospel uh, and can do it effectively. Uh, what a blessing it is. And we're thankful for that. How many men we have in the service tonight, you know the Lord's called you to preach. Just hold your hand up. There's one, two, three, four. Good. There's four or five people in here right now we know the Lord's called you to preach. And so we're thankful for that. What a blessing. And I want to I use these men, give them opportunities to preach and, and uh let God use their life, and uh, God, God's word is, uh, is the power of God and the salvation it speaks to our hearts, uh, but God will take his word and uh, the life of the vessel through which he's going to deliver it, and uh, he uses their life, uh, things going on in their life, circumstances and situations to make that word uh, have uh, have a, a fresh significance every time we hear the Word of God preached. And so I'm thankful for these men, and uh, I'm, I want to use them. Uh, next Sunday night, Brother Eric's going to preach for me. Uh, Wednesday evening, I'm going to have Brother Marty preach and before he goes back to school. Uh, but uh, we're thankful for these men, appreciate them. And uh, I'm thankful for Brother Doug, and uh, uh, appreciate him, pray for him, and uh, just uh, lift him up in prayer. and. Uh, let's God just keep using him, and we're thankful to have him uh, here ministering in our church and working with the young people and all these kind of things, and uh, we're just blessed uh, and uh, thankful. But we're going to ask him to come, if he will, and just bring the message for us here this evening.
always a blessing to be able to get up here and preach uh, in front of the church and uh, over there with the youth group every Wednesday, but it's always nice to be able to, uh, to preach out here in the regular church service. So uh, if you would, turn with me tonight to 2 Samuel uh, chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. Second Samuel chapter number 12 is a very, uh, it's a familiar passage of scripture, but I know that I personally haven't heard a whole lot of messages on it, and probably simply because of the, the content of what is in uh, this passage of scripture, it's a little uncomfortable uh, to read what happens in, uh, in Second Samuel chapter number 12, but the Lord has really, had, since pastor uh, asked me to preach tonight, the Lord uh, has just had this specific um, passage of scripture uh, on my heart and as I uh, prayed about what the Lord would have me to preach uh, you know I, at first uh, I was a little confused as to you know why this particular passage of scripture but as I began to study and I began to keep praying about it I believe that the Lord has shown me uh, why he wants me to preach this message tonight we're coming down uh, to this being the last service of uh, 2013 and uh and it's, a t it's one of those times where we, as Christians, we need to step back and take inventory of, uh, of 2013, what we did do and what we should have done and what we could have done, and begin to prepare and to plan for what we are going to be and the kind of people that we are going to be in 2014. So we're going to start here in verse number uh, number one. We're going to read a majority of this passage of Scripture. We're going to start here in uh, verse number one. The Bible says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him. And with his children it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb uh, fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee uh, the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the, uh, the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with him. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, uh, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. 
Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what uh, you have to say to us tonight. Lord, I pray that you just help me as I speak tonight. Just give me the words you'd have me to say. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd open hearts tonight that uh, we might be able to take something from your word and apply it to our lives and we'll not fail to give you all the praise and honor and glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Here in this uh, passage of scripture, this, uh, like I said, this is a very familiar passage of scripture. This is uh, right after David uh, had uh, committed one of the biggest sins, in, well, two of the biggest sins in his life. Uh, that was adultery with uh, Bathsheba and uh, he committed the act of murder uh, with uh, Uriah the Hittite. And here we see the Lord going, uh, or uh, the Lord sending Nathan to David to confront David about his sin. And uh, the, last, uh, the last several times that I've preached, the Lord has just really uh, ha- has interested me in the co- some of the questions of the Bible. Uh, many times we look over the question, we just read those questions and we go on and we go about our way uh, having read those but not really taking into consideration the answers to those questions. Uh, thankfully, uh, we serve a God and we have God's word and in God's word every question has an answer. Uh, it's, th- this is not a book that has questions that are not answered. When, when God gives us a question, when God gives a question in His Scripture, there is an answer, and I'm thankful for that. And the one question that we want to look at tonight, or I want to look at just for a few minutes tonight, is uh, this question in verse number 22. The Bible says, Who can tell whether God will be gracious? Who can tell whether God will be gracious? And we know that that has an answer for that. David was here, and that was the question that was on David's mind here in this passage of Scripture. As he's going through this trial in his life, the one question on his mind was, who can tell whether God will be gracious in this situation? And again, as we take a look at uh, this year, as we take a look at what's going on in this world today, we can see a lot of bad that's going on. We can see a lot of negative things uh, from uh, crime being at an all-time high, abortions being at an all-time high, all these things that we see in the news uh, every single day. There's not a single day that goes by that we don't see a bad thing in the news. Uh, If you read the paper, you'll see something bad in, in, in the paper every single day that you open that paper. That's the kind of society, that's the kind of world we live in today. And we know that that is how it is going to be. We know that the Bible uh, tells us that at the end of days that the world will be like it was in the day of Noah. And we can see that happening. We can see much of the same thing going on in the same capacity, in the same level of uh, evil in, in, in the world today as it was back then, if not worse right now. All the things that were going on at the time, we see it going on now. The Bible said that everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And we see that going on on a daily basis. And my question that I have to ask myself, and I ask myself on a daily basis and especially as we approach 2014 is in 2014 will God be gracious? In the next coming days 
will God be gracious? And as we take a look at this passage of Scripture here tonight, I hope that you'll take in a, a, a consideration of your own life and what we can do to bring down the grace of God upon our lives, on the lives of those we know, this church, this community, this nation, this world. What can you do specifically to bring about the grace of God in your life? In verse number 1, the Bible says, The Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The first thing that I want to look at tonight in this passage of Scripture, thinking about this question of who can tell whether God will be gracious, is we want to look at the rich man and the church. The rich man and the church. Here in this passage of Scripture, we see the rich man and we see the poor man. In verse number 2, the Bible says that the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. He had a lot of stuff. The rich man had just about anything that he would ever need or ever want or uh, could ever hope to have, the rich man had it. There was nothing that he needed. There was nothing that uh, he wanted. He had it all. And then there was the poor man. The poor man, the Bible says that the poor man had nothing. He had nothing save one little ewe lamb. And that was the most precious thing to that poor man was that one precious ewe lamb. And the Bible says that the rich man had a, a traveler come to him. And instead of taking a ewe lamb from his flock that he had probably hundreds of ewe lambs. He chose not to take of his own, but to take of that poor man that had nothing, just that one little ewe lamb. And he took that ewe lamb and he, and he killed that lamb and he dressed it and he gave it to this traveler. And just taking that only thing that that poor man had. David goes... Uh, David hears this story that Nathan is telling to him. Uh, David, thinking this was an actual real-life event that was going on, and David was angry. David, David's uh, fury just welled up in him. And we know that this point in David's life, he's not exactly right with God, so that fear, that wrath was quickly come upon him, and David makes the statement that the man who did this is going to die. He shall surely die, and I'm the king. I'm the king, and I, I say that this man that did this thing it should die. And then to his horror, Nathan looks at him and says, You, David, thou art the man. You are the man in this story. We see the rich man in this passage of Scripture, he, he's gained everything that he could possibly have. Everything that he could possibly have. But how, how can this, how can we apply this to our lives? How can we apply this to the church? As I was looking at this passage of Scripture, I, look, I, I can see some things in this passage of Scripture in the, this first couple of verses that really... Uh, it really shows us where the church is. Not necessarily this church uh, in itself, in this body of believers, but the church as a whole, we can see, them, see the church in this first passage of Scripture. You say, oh, it's the, poor, it's the poor man that's being persecuted in this world. It's the poor man that getting everything taken away from him. That has to be the church. And sadly, that's not the case. Sadly, would the church tends to be more like the rich man. You see, as a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've uh, asked Him to be your Lord and your Savior, He's given you everything that you could possibly ever need. We are, uh, as Christians, oh, there's none richer than us. Bill Gates, he doesn't, he's not richer than us. Uh, Donald Trump, he's not richer than us. The Christian who has accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior has been given everything that we could ever hope or want or need in this world today. 
But the lost, they only have one thing in this world. One thing. The one thing, simple thing that they have is the hope of Jesus Christ. That poor man, he only had that one little ewe lamb. That's all he had. That's the only thing that he could have to his name. And the only thing that the world has is the hope of Jesus Christ. And as a church, we have gained everything as that we can possibly want, but yet we take from the world that one thing that they need. Jesus Christ. Instead of being the church who goes to the poor who, who tells the poor about Jesus Christ, about what he can have, what, what the Lord can do for him, and that the Lord can make him rich. We take the one thing that they have, the hope of Jesus Christ, and we hoard it to ourselves. You say, I don't do that. I, that's not me. I've never once done that. When's the last time you went on bus visitation? When's the last time that you told somebody about Jesus Christ? When's the last time that you simply took a gospel track out of your pocket and handed it to somebody that was walking by? That could have been that person that you were walking by could have been wearing the nicest clothes that you've ever seen anybody wear, but could have been the poorest person that you've ever met in your life because they didn't have Jesus Christ as their Savior. Did you hoard? The one thing that they have, the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope of eternity, we have it all. We have everything that we need in Jesus Christ, but there's somebody else out there that you're going to run into tonight, tomorrow, sometime this week that needs Jesus Christ. Are you going to take that one thing that they have, that they need, and keep it for yourself. The sad reality of it all is that most Christians will. Most Christians will go from now until next Sunday, and they'll never tell anybody about Jesus Christ. They'll never tell anybody of what God can do for them and how rich that God can make them. Not monetarily, not with money and houses and cars and lands and all that, not with that, but how rich God can make them when he lives in their heart and becomes their Lord and Savior. Most Christians will never tell a single soul about Jesus Christ. I believe it was Pastor Tim not too, uh, a couple months ago was talking about how that majority of people will go their entire Christian life without telling one person about Jesus Christ. And if that's how we are, if that's what we are, we're just like that rich man. We're taking the one thing that the world needs and taking it from them. Who can tell whether, the, uh, whether God will be gracious? I believe if we continue to act like the rich man, I don't believe that we'll have the grace of God on our lives, on our family's lives, on the lives of this church, on the lives of this community, on the lives of this nation, or the world. I just don't believe it. The second thing we want to look at tonight is the revelation of David's sin. Nathan tells David uh, this story about this, uh, this uh, rich man and poor man, and though it was a parable, though God was just using it to teach a lesson, to, to, to show David what David was doing, David didn't realize his own sin. Verse number uh, 7, the Bible says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and uh, of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine house, uh, out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives for thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And then in verse number 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. From the time that we see the sin that David commits uh, of uh, lying with Bathsheba until this time in verse number 12, and this has been an extensive time because uh, in the amount of time that we see the sin initially being committed and here in verse number 13, uh, David has already plotted out a way to kill Uriah. He has put that plan in action. He has sent Uriah to war, put Uriah on the front line of the battle intentionally, told the, told the army to fall back without telling Uriah to do the same. Uriah is killed. The news is given to Bathsheba, and then David takes Bathsheba to be his wife. All in this matter of time, so from where we see him uh, committing the, that first sin there in chapter number 11 until verse number 13 here in chapter number 12, this is an extensive period of time. But in that period of time, not one time do we see David saying, I have sinned. And not one time do we see that David is taking responsibility of the sin in his life. Not one time. But finally... Uh, when, when Nathan confronts David and reveals to David, listen, David, though you, you don't see it, you've sinned against God. David, in this amount of time, has become complacent in his own sin. He's, been, he's become okay with it. If Nathan had never come to David and confronted David face to face, David would have continued to go on from day to day living in his sin. He had become complacent in it. He had no thoughts of ever uh, confessing and repenting of his sin. He'd already taken Bathsheba to be his wife. And then he was so quick here in verse number 5 to pass judgment on someone else who'd done wrong that, he, chose, uh, that he, 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 he could pass judgment and not even pass judgment on his own sin because he had become so complacent in his life. And sin has a way uh, of, of just making you not think right. And how many times have we done the same thing that David is doing right now? We have our own sins. We have our own vices that are, uh, that are controlling our lives, but when we see the sin in somebody else's life, we're so quick to say, hey, 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 look what he did. Look what she did. Did you see what she said? Did you hear what she said? Did you see what he did? When our heart is so full of sin that we need to take care of ourselves. This is where David was in his life. And then finally Nathan begins to question him about his life. And Nathan says to David, didn't God give you everything? Didn't God allow you to be the king over Israel? You were a shepherd. That was what you were supposed to be. But God chose to anoint you and make you king. And not only did he make you king, he gave you the throne of Saul. And the wives of Saul, well, God gave them to you too. And everything that was Saul's is now yours. And everything that you could ever want or think of, I've given it to you. Or the Lord's given it to you. 
And if there was any other, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, the Lord would have given you such and such things that you needed and wanted if that wasn't enough. How did you do this evil in God's sight? And as David's sin was laid out before him, David begins to be convicted of his sin. And finally, in verse number 13, conviction broke through the complacency and David confesses his sin before Nathan and before God. We're living in a day and age that the world is getting worse and worse. And do we blame that decline on the world? Most of us want to. We want to blame the, the, the moral decline on the world and on sin, but we can't blame the moral decline on sin uh, and on the world because the, the world and sin, it's, it's like an infection. And an infection's sole purpose is to destroy and that infection, once it sets in, it's going to keep waxing worse and worse and worse until it destroys that thing that is, is infected. That's sin. But an infection can be cured. So it's not the world's fault that morality and all these things are waxing worse and worse. It's not the world's fault. And as much as we don't want to hear that, it's not the world's fault. They have that infection of sin in the world. But we hold the cure. If the world is waxing worse and worse and worse and worse on a day, daily basis, it's because they're not getting the cure, which is Jesus Christ, because we're like the rich man and taking the cure to ourselves. That's what David was doing. And David had to pay a price for his sin. The Bible says that Nathan told David that the sword would never depart from his house. His life, his family would be uh, wrecked and plagued by the sword in his house, by death in his house. And that the son that Bathsheba uh, would bear, uh, had, uh, had bore to David would die. A lot of preachers will preach that because it's uncomfortable to talk about a child dying because of the sin of the father. But that is what is happening here in this passage of Scripture. And that is what is happening in the world today. You say, what do you mean? We are just like David. David had the opportunity to do everything right. But he chose to sin, he chose to do wrong, he chose to do evil in the sight of God, and now something had to happen. And David finally repents in verse number 13. So we've seen the rich man in the church, we see the revelation of David's sin, and the third thing we're going to look at tonight is the repentant actions of David. Here in verse number 13, David, again, we said, finally confesses his sin before the Lord. He says, you know what? I've done wrong. The, I sinned against the Lord. I committed adultery. I committed murder. That's what happened. I did that. That was me. And, I, and I'm confessing my sin before the Lord. And, and David confesses his sin before the Lord. But then immediately, <coughs> as David confesses, his sin to the Lord, immediately when, when Nathan leaves, Nathan tells him that he's, the Lord will strike the child that uh, Uriah's wife uh, barren to David, and it, it, that he was going to strike it sick. And then immediately in verse number 16, the Bible says, David therefore besought God for the child. Nowhere from chapter 11 until verse number, thir uh, until verse number 16 in, in, in chapter number 12, do we see David uh, consulting God or, or, or going and uh, beseeching uh, the things of God? But finally, as he confesses his sin, immediately he commits himself to prayer. 
And that's the one thing that we should be doing on a daily day basis. Do you want the grace of God on your life? Do you want the grace of God on the lives of others? Are you praying about it? God, David now has to pray. That's all he can do. But he wants the grace of God upon his son. And, and we see him immediately committing himself to prayer. And as we look at this world today and we see that it is waxing worse and worse because of us, it should, it should convict us to the point where we flood the altars with prayer. Uh, do you want to see a change in the world today? It's going to start on the altars. David commits himself to prayer, but David doesn't just pray like many of us pray uh, today. Uh, you go out to eat, Lord bless his food, amen. You know, that's not the kind of prayer that David prayed. The kind of prayer that David prayed was a fervent, outpouring, outcry of love and compassion for his son. We see this by the way that David prayed. The Bible says that David therefore besought God for the child and David fasted. David took all the luxuries that he had. He was the king. He had, he had all the luxuries of the kingdom, every good food, every good uh, drink, everything that he could want and to, to satisfy himself. He did away with it. He said, until God shows grace on me or my child, I will not eat or drink or do anything except pray until God answers my prayer. And he begins to fast. And not only did he fast, but the Bible says that he went in and he lay all night upon the earth. Uh, he, was, he was prostrate on the earth. And, and when you think about that, it wasn't, he wasn't kneeled down on the earth. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't leaning up against an altar like many of us do. He was face first in the ground as low as he could possibly get because he knew that if this was his fault, first of all, and he knew that his pride had, 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 had brought this about, and he wanted to get as humble and low as he could. He wanted to take as much as, of himself out as he could and rely solely and fully on God himself. The Bible says that he fasted and he, and he, and he, he, he laid himself prostrate out on the ground all night upon the earth and when, when the elders of his house came in there to, to, to get him to eat and, and, and to get him to drink and, and really uh, just to, uh, to help him, David wouldn't even let him. David, uh, David made them leave. David wouldn't let them help him. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink until it was all over because he had finally committed himself to doing what he knew he should have been doing all along. And David, then the Bible says, and when uh, the Bible says in verse number 18 that uh, the child died, and it, ca it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. David lays prostrate out on the floor with nothing to eat, nothing to drink for seven days in prayer. When's the last time you spent seven days in prayer? Nonstop. Face face in the ground, just humble before God. When's the, la when's the last time you spent 15 minutes in prayer? David prays seven days straight. And on the seventh day, the Bible says that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that, uh, that, that the child was dead. For the whole while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that this child is dead? So, so they wouldn't even tell him that the child had died because they were afraid that David would hurt himself or, or, or vex himself in some way. They didn't even want to tell him. And, da and David hears their whispers and perceives that the child was dead. And uh, he asks him, is the child dead? And they tell him. And then the Bible says that David arose from the earth, he washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. See, what, what's the point of that verse in that scripture? 
it lets us know that David was at a place in his life where he was making a change. He was making a change. He got up and he washed himself because he's dirty. He's, he's been face first in the dirt and the mud for seven days now. He's dirty. He gets up, he washes himself, he says he anoints himself. In other words, he, 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 he's made a decision that he is going to now, from this point on, live exactly how God wants him to live. He anoints himself, he changes his apparel, and then uh, he says he changes his apparel. He was making a complete change in his life. He wanted everyone around him to know that from this day on, I'm a different person. And I'm going to make sure that I take the gospel to everyone that I can see. I'm going to make sure that everything from now on is done exactly right because I want the grace of God upon my house. You say God didn't show grace in this, in this story. Yes, he did. Though the child died, we don't know how old the child was, uh, but uh, it, we kind of get the impression that, that this child probably had not re uh, reached the age of accountability. And, and through uh, studying God's word, we know that, uh, that that child would be pardoned. So where's the grace found in this? Well, the grace is found in the fact that God did not kill David. David had already passed judgment on the person that had done all this, not knowing that it was himself. David said, the man that did this shall surely die. And God showed grace by not taking David's life. But he cries out for grace. David cries out for grace. And, but uh, David's servants, they see him get up and he, they see him change his clothes and cleanse himself and then after he does all that he sits down to eat and the servants are confused the servants uh, they see this and, and they see uh, at a point in David's life where David should just be absolutely wrecked because he just lost his son and for seven days he wouldn't eat he wouldn't drink he wouldn't get up off the floor he wouldn't stop praying but now his son is dead you would think, and they were afraid that he was going to vex himself or hurt himself, but instead he gets up, he takes a bath, he changes his clothes, and he eats. And they're completely confused. Why would, why would he do this? And David answers, uh, he answers them, and he says, uh, in verse number 22, he says, And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me? Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Yes, God passed judgment and said that his son would die. But David did the only thing that he knew to do, and he begged for the grace of God upon his child. And he asked this question, uh, Who can tell whether God would choose to be gracious to me and let me keep my child? That's the only hope that I have. While my child was yet alive, I had the hope that God would be, show grace to my child. But now that he's dead, I can go to him, but he can't come to me. So how, what, what can we take away from this in this passage of Scripture? While he was yet alive, David did something. There's going to come a point in time where God says enough is enough. He's going to send His Son to take us out of here. And the Bible says uh, those who have died will be raised up to, get, to meet uh, Jesus in the air and then we, then we who are alive and remain shall then be gathered up together with Him. And those are the people that will escape, escape the tribulation. And just like David, while he was yet alive, he cried out for the grace of God upon his son's life. And while we are yet still here, we've got to be doing the same. It's high time that we stop hoarding the things of God for ourselves and get down on our hands and knees, fill the altars with people crying out for the grace of God 
upon our lives, upon the lives of those around us. That's what David did. Now, in this passage of Scripture, God did not see fit to not take David's son. You say, well, are we doing this all in vain? No. Christ has not yet passed judgment upon us. God hasn't quite yet passed judgment upon this country, on this world. He's not passed judgment yet. And while there's still time, God says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and will turn, uh, will seek my face, and will turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will kill their land. That's not a maybe. That's not a might. The Bible says he will. You see, the ending to our story doesn't have to end the same. Though we are living in a time and a situation almost identical to what David is going through here, our end result can be different. But the only way that it will be different is if we fill the altars with people crying out for the grace of God. So I ask the question tonight, who can tell if the Lord will be gracious? According to my Bible, the infallible Word of God, I can definitely say, yes, in 2014, God will be gracious if we cry out to God for His grace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this day. We thank You for everything that's been said and done. Lord, I pray for each and every person that is here tonight. I pray that as, as the invitation is played, I pray that... Uh, just uh, every person here would consider their own lives and consider uh, are we as Christians, are we as a body of believers, are we doing everything that we can to take the gospel to a world that, Lord, you're the, on, they're, they're, you're the only hope that they have. You're that one thing that they have, the, a hope of, that they need, that can do something in their life. You're the only thing. And I pray that this church, I pray that every single person in this church would decide, I'm not going to take from the world what they need, but I'm going to give everything uh, in my power to bringing it to them. Lord, I pray that uh, tonight as the altars prayed, I pray that just you would convict hearts and that the altars would be filled with people crying out for the grace of God upon this country in this coming year. And Lord, we'll not fail to give you all the praise and honor and glory. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Sing the second verse, verse 2. verse verse 4 
moment Evan will come and dismiss our service but I appreciate the message tonight and what brother Doug mentioned there as he began to preach was that's the last message we'll hear in our church in the year 2013 and uh, so that's a great great message uh, I'm thankful when we look forward to a new year uh, because of the power of the Lord because of his love because of his grace we can look forward to a new year with hope with expectancy uh, because of the Lord, because of who He is and what He is. And I just thought as He was preaching, you know, we can look forward to the new year, uh, to the potential that there is in touching other people's lives with the life of Christ as we let Him live through our life, how that can impact the lives of others, touching people's lives with the gospel, the word of life, and giving that out, sharing it, witnessing, uh, letting God use our lives. And the potential there is, uh, to live in victory over sin. Uh, we, uh, we fight and battle with the flesh, the world, and the devil, and uh, it gets its victories, but we can live in victory over sin. This coming year, we can win some victories, uh, and, uh, and this year can be different. We, we, can, we can be profitable servants because of the Lord and because of who He is. Uh, I think about the potential for lives that can be saved. Of people today whose lives are wasted and ruined and hopeless, uh, but when they are saved, their lives can be different. They can be changed because of the power of Christ. And think about the potential for lives that are clean, lives that are surrendered unto the Lord, lives placed in the Lord's hands. Uh, what great potential there is in them, and that potential is in all of our lives right here if we'll if we'll put our life in the Lord's hands. This coming year could be a tremendous year. I'm excited about it. We're planning, praying, working, putting things together for <clears throat> our vision night. You might notice that slide on our announcements before the service on January the 19th. We're going to be uh, trying to cast a vision for this coming year throughout the ministries of our church, uh, ways that that will give you opportunities personally and corporately as a church. Uh, different things, new things that we are looking at for this coming year to uh, stay connected with each other plus try to reach our community and so we're looking forward to these things and the potential that there is in the Lord and uh, we're uh, hopeful and expectant about these things so, uh, good good message tonight Brother Evan you come right ahead and just finish us out here this evening Amen. Well, it's just been a great day in the Lord's house and just appreciate good Bible preaching. And we look forward to uh, continuing that now on uh, through our coming services. Don't forget about Wednesday. We'll have a service at 7 o'clock. So be praying about that, inviting people. And uh, we look forward to that. Uh, but we'll finish tonight with just a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just again thank you for uh, the great day we've been able to have in your house and just being able to hear uh, preaching from your word. We thank you that you loved us so much that you allowed your son to come and die in our place so that we could have salvation. Lord, we're thankful that he didn't stay in that tomb, but that uh, by your power he rose again and he's alive today, making intercession for us. We're so thankful for that truth, Lord. And <clears throat> we just ask you to help us to continue to learn, continue to grow in our faith, and continue to be uh, servants for you. As we look towards a new year, we pray that you would help us to do more than we've ever done before uh, in our lives and in the life of our church for your honor and your glory. So we ask you to help us with that. Uh, help us just to uh, be focused on you and the things that you have for us. We thank you for the example of David that we were able to look at today, Lord, and we realize that although he uh, made a great error in his life with uh, those sins that uh, because he sought after you and asked for your forgiveness, you gave it to him, Lord, and you were able then to use him in a mighty way. And we're thankful uh, for that uh, truth, Lord, that if we will just seek after you, you'll uh, use us as well, Lord. So we thank you for that. We uh, just love you, Lord, and ask you to continue to, to be in our lives and help us, Lord. But we uh, ask you to help us as we come back uh, and go back out and live our lives. Help us just to serve you with all that we have, Lord, but we love you, we thank you, and it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray, and amen.